Welcome back to the video notes on higher human biology. This is the second key area of unit one, which is structure and replication of DNA. Similarly to the first key area, we're going to split it up into three videos. Uh, important to remind you again, you would be doing this over a week in class. You would be getting like three hours in class to do this. So don't sit and do it all at once. You're just going to get bombarded with information. It's going to be hard. Take your time, do a video at a time and then spend some time looking at the sway make sure you're taking notes and make sure you're getting everything making sense. Don't just fly through all the videos and then be done with it. Take your time and make sure it makes sense because there's a lot of information to come. So this one, all about DNA, this first one we're doing right now is about the structure of DNA. Okay, so here are the things that you should know from National 5 about DNA. Number one, it's found in the nucleus of all cells that have a nucleus. It's double-stranded, so two strands opposite each other, twisted into a double helix shape. And that word you have to be able to know. There are four bases that make up the DNA code, so those bases sit opposite each other and match up with their complementary relationship and those bases you must be able to name them the letters are not enough so adenine cytosine guanine and thymine you have to be able to name them and the order of the bases is what's important for gene expression so remember we in national five we stray a little bit into dna bases make up protein okay so remember that idea that a gene codes for a single protein it's the gene is a specific order of bases it's going to make a specific protein so, structure of DNA, again, something you should already know, it's held inside that nucleus, that's where we find the DNA um, and all the cells that do have a nucleus. What we're now going to touch on higher is something called a nucleotide. So you're used to the fact that DNA is this double-stranded helix made up of the backbone and the bases. We're now going to look a little bit more at what actually makes up that backbone. So the bases are the same, but a bit more of how the backbone is actually formed, and that's to do with a structure called a nucleotide. Okay, so nucleotides have got three components that you need to be able to name. Okay, they've got a phosphate and in DNA they have a deoxyribose sugar. Now that is important because we also look at a thing called RNA that has a ribonucleic, uh, ribose sugar. Okay, so the idea is the D is significant in the DNA. It's talking about a deoxyribose sugar. Okay, so you've got your phosphate, your deoxyribose sugar, and your base. And the base could be adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. Okay? Okay. Yeah. So, similar to what Ms. Mills says, this shows your example of where the bases can change. So, that little rectangle, and they are usually drawn like this. It is a pentagon that the deoxyribose sugar is drawn at. It will always be that. We're going to touch on exactly why it's got five sides in a wee minute. Um, but it will always look like this shape. The thing that changes is the bases, like Miss Mills has just said. And exam questions crop up every now and then with a picture like this, and that they've got the circle labelled A, the pentagon labelled B, and the square labelled C, and they ask you to name the parts, like what is the pentagon. Uh, so you need to be able to define what they are. Okay, so the idea is nucleotides line up with each other to form a single strand of DNA, as in the diagram that you can see in front of you. OK, each nucleotide bonds with another nucleotide using a thing called a sugar phosphate bond. Now, that bond is called a sugar phosphate bond because it binds between a phosphate of one nucleotide and the sugar of another nucleotide. And you can see how they all line up on there. So on that diagram, there are three nucleotides that are joined together by two sugar phosphate bonds. So it's going phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, all the way down one single strand of DNA. And on the right side of the diagram, we've got a base, another base and another base. So that could be, I don't know, thymine, adenine and guanine going down the way. A normal DNA strand would form thousands and thousands and thousands of these nucleotides. But this is how we get an order of bases starting to be constructed. Now, the sugar phosphate bonds are important because they are permanent. They are very, very strong bonds. And this is good because you don't want your DNA suddenly collapsing and falling apart halfway through mitosis or something like that. So once the sugar phosphate bond is formed, it is permanent and it is really, really nice and strong. Okay. Um, what is important to note is that sugar phosphate bond, uh, or the, the backbone that's being produced from these sugar phosphates, that's exactly what you've seen before. Now I've got a diagram here. It's going to be hard for you to see because it's in the bottom corner. But when you see a DNA strand looking like this, that bit in black that you're used to seeing, that bit that is the backbone, that is what we're talking about. We're just looking at it now saying it's not just a line. It is this deoxyribose sugar phosphate and the bond between them that links them all. So that, that black line you're used to seeing 
that is what the sugar phosphate bond is actually representing. Um, so on this diagram here, you can see the deoxyribose, and it's actually got labelled C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5 coming off the top. Now, these are the different carbons in the structure of it, and this is really important. It links to an idea that we are about to come onto, but you need to know exactly where each of these are. It's not a case that it is a five carbon molecule that you just need to name any of them. It has to be in this order. So where C1 is in this diagram, C1 always is. Same with C2, C3, C4, and C5 is always that one coming off the top, because that's the one that's going to be connecting to the phosphate. The important ones, the most important ones out there are the three and the five. I'll get into that in a bit, but it's to do with saying which way up the strand is going. Basically, is it is it three to five or is it five, three? Is it, we'll get into it. Don't worry. OK, so looking at this diagram is at the C5, you're going to have a phosphate attached onto that C5. OK, that's going to form part of the overall nucleotide. At the C3, you'd have a sugar phosphate bond strutting down to the phosphate of another nucleotide okay and again the number of the carbon indicates the number at each end of the dna strand so that's talking about prime and we'll get into that second in, in, a, in a minute or two but essentially at the end of the dna strand is either going to be three prime talking about the c3 is at the bottom or it's going to be five primes talking about the fact that the c5 is going to be at the bottom or the top OK, but it's talking about these carbon arrangements when we're talking about prime. OK, so as you can see here, an idea that you should again know from National 5, thymine and adenine bases bond together and the guanine and the cytosine bases bond together. This is always the way this does not change. Um, you do still need to know this at higher. But the thing that we're now building on is that idea of these little red dashes between them that you can see in this diagram. So you can see them between the thymine in one nucleotide to the adenine in the other, the guanine and the cytosine, and then again the adenine and thymine. You can see these little red dot dashes between them. These represent hydrogen bonds. So that's how the bases are actually held together. If you remember from National 5, we say it's the complementary base pairs that give it that shape. It's these complementary base pairs that are being held together by hydrogen bonds that actually give that twisted helix shape. So you need to know that these are hydrogen bonds that hold them together. Very common exam question. Now, hydrogen bonds are a bit special. If you do chemistry, higher chemistry, possibly even National 5, maybe you've heard of hydrogen bonds before. They're very weak bonds. They're not like proper chemical bonds where two things are completely cemented together using electrons. They are weaker forces of attraction. OK, um, now this is good. We do not want bases permanently bound together because when we look at DNA replication and protein synthesis, bases need to pull apart for those processes. And we don't want them breaking permanently and, and shattering. We just want them to go apart temporarily and then be able to lock them back together again. So this is good that we have a temporary hydrogen bond in between those in order for that to occur. So in terms of the structure of DNA, this is bringing back to the three prime, five prime idea that we've just briefly mentioned so far. So just before I talk about that, I'm going to say the idea that DNA strands are anti-parallel. And you need to know this idea, how you need to be able to describe DNA strands as anti-parallel. And what that means is that one runs up the way and one runs down the way, basically. They are the opposite. You can see in this diagram, the one on the left, the pentagons all point up with three prime at the bottom and five prime at the, pop, the top. That's what the little apostrophe means. So three apostrophe, five apostrophe just means three prime, five prime. So this one is all running up the way. Whereas if you look at the other side of the strand, it starts with three prime at the top. It is five prime at the bottom and the pentagons are all pointing down the way. So the whole strand is basically taken and flipped upside down. So numbers are at the opposite end and the pentagons are also facing the opposite way. And that's a really important thing to remember mm -hmm. because it means that your phosphate bond, your sugar phosphate bonds, are in different places. It's not just that the hexagons are still the same way up. So the whole strand has been flipped and that's really important to know. Okay, now a useful thing to remember is exam questions, they might ask you to fill in the three and five prime ends. So they'll give you a diagram and they'll put five primes somewhere on the diagram and then they'll have empty boxes at the ends of all the other strands and you have to work out, okay, if I've got five prime at this top end, the other end of the DNA strand has to be three prime. And then if I've got five prime at this top end, the opposite side has to be three prime. OK, notice that the five and the three prime never sit next to each other. OK, they've always got that diagonal relationship. Um, a way to try and remember which one is which. There is a phosphate at the five prime end. 
Okay, so try and get that F sound together, five prime phosphate, which means the other end must be the three prime end. Okay, so if you ever get a diagram that's got zero labels as far as three and five prime ends, find the phosphate, that's the five prime end. Okay, and the reason why it's talking about five prime is it's talking about that carbon orientation. Okay, you've got the five prime carbon is sitting at the five prime end, the three prime carbon is sitting at the three prime end. OK, so that's why we've got these numbers five and three. It's talking about the carbons in the deoxyribose sugar. OK, so the final thing I'm going to touch on in this uh, part of the PowerPoint is the idea that DNA is really, really long. And you should know this by now because we've talked about how many chromosomes we have in each nucleus. Like every human has 46 chromosomes in one nucleus. And if you think about your chromosome, that's just stacks of genes which is the genes are just made up of sections of DNA. So there's so much DNA in each of your cells. There's millions and millions and millions of strands of our length of DNA in your cells. And that has to be packed in somehow. It doesn't just all sit there. It's got to be really strategically packed so all of that DNA can fit in each one of the millions and trillions of cells that make you up. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at the diagram, that diagram shows 1.98 metres. Now, from one, think about how small a cell was when we looked at... Uh, doing cell structure at the start of National 5. And you think about how small an animal cell is. You've got 46 chromosomes in there. You've got a nucleus, which is even smaller than the actual cell, and yet it contains two metres of stuff. Okay, so how can two metres of stuff fit in a tiny nucleus? The answer to that is really, really clever packaging. Yeah, so for DNA packaging, uh, it's actually to do with proteins again. We talk about it, the idea of it being beads on a string. And I think there's a picture in the next slide that will show you what we mean by that. But basically, the DNA is wound around specific protein molecules. And then it does just look like a long strand with lots of little beads on it. And that allows the DNA to be wound up tightly and basically make it take up much less space. Okay. So you can see this arrangement here. This is a rarer question. It pops up every now and then, but it's a useful thing to know. So the string that you can see right around, that's representing the DNA, whereas we've got blobs of stuff. And again, your standard answer of what is this made of in biology now should usually be protein. If you don't know the answer, it's going to be made of protein because we are mostly protein. OK, um, so you've got your protein beads and they wrap around the DNA string. And think about when we're thinking about mitosis, where we talk about chromosomes condensing or uh, becoming visible. What happens is they wind really, really tightly around those beads. And when they're not condensing, when they go invisible, they are a bit looser and a bit more stringy and longer. So they're thinner and less easy to see. OK, so in terms of the advantages that this shows in DNA packaging, if you think about it in your life, if you had a big ball of wool, what is easier to deal with when that is a big mess? when it's untangled or when it's wound nicely together. You can even think of it like your headphones. If you put them, tie them up nicely and then put a little clip or something to hold it on, they're going to be so much easier to unwind. If you just shove them in your pocket, they come out in a big mess and it is horrible. It is so much easier when things are packaged appropriately. Uh, and again, like Miss Mills has just said, one of the big advantages for this is during mitosis is that those D that DNA can be really, really tightly packed. It can be really, really loosely packed. It is depending on whether the cell is going through mitosis or not, how it needs it to be. OK, so that's pretty much it in terms of structure of DNA. Important things are highlighted here. So the nucleotide, you need to be able to identify those three structures from a picture of a nucleotide or possibly several nucleotides joined together. So you need to be able to identify that's a base, that's a deoxyribose sugar, uh, that's a phosphate. OK, the sugar phosphate bond, it's connecting the sugar and the phosphate of two nucleotides together, and that's going to form the DNA backbone. So that's an important term there. Do hydrogen bonds. Um, you need to know hydrogen bonds, the idea that these are these weak bonds that can be easily broken, that form between the complementary bases of the opposite strands. Uh, and then the five, the three prime and the five prime end of DNA. So the idea that it shows you what end of the DNA you are at, what side of the phosphate uh, and the deoxyribose sugar are we actually talking about and knowing the orientation of the DNA and that anti-parallel comparison that one is running three prime to five prime the other one is running five prime to three prime because that's really, really important for DNA replication, which is what the next video is going to be about. So I would recommend 
draw this out, draw a nucleotide, draw three or four nucleotides drawn together, get used to labelling it where three prime and five prime is, even do it on every nucleotide just to get into that habit, because that concept is really, really important for what we're about to touch on next. When the past paper questions get released on this as well, you'll see there are quite a few that are about identifying three and five prime end. And again, it's considered to be basic knowledge, so it's something you need to get to grips with. Even if you don't understand the idea, just remember that the numbers five and three are always opposite each other. OK, kind of think of it like a Sudoku. You don't actually have to understand the concept. Just five and three always opposite, never side by side. OK, uh, so that's the end of this particular thing. The next one will be on DNA replication. Um, and remember. Look at the sway as well, because it's got, oh, lots, yeah. it's it's got lots more pictures on it as well. We've got a few more on it for that one. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you've got any questions, don't hesitate to ask us. Yes. Okay.